Chapter 6. Some account of Brimstone Hill in Montserrat, favorable change in the author's situation. He commences his merchant with three pence, his various success in dealing in the different islands, and America, and the impositions he meets within his transactions with Europeans, a curious imposition on human nature, danger of the serfs in the West Indies, remarkable instance of kidnapping a free mulatto. The author is nearly murdered by Dr. Perkins in Savannah. In the preceding chapter I have set before the reader a few of those many instances of oppression, extortion, and cruelty, which I have been a witness to in the West Indies, but, were I to enumerate them all, the catalogue would be tedious and disgusting. The punishments of the slaves on every trifling occasion are so frequent, and so well known together with the different instruments with which they are tortured, that it cannot any longer afford novelty to recite them, and they are too shocking to yield delight either to the writer or the reader. I shall therefore hereafter only mention such as incidentally befell myself in the course of my adventures. In the variety of departments in which I was employed by my master, I had an opportunity of seeing many curious scenes in different islands, but, above all, I was struck with a celebrated curiosity called Brimstone Hill, which is a high and steep mountain, some few miles from the town of Plymouth in Montserrat. I had often heard of some wonders that were to be seen on this hill, and I went once with some white and black people to visit it. When we arrived at the top, I saw under different cliffs great flakes of brimstone, occasioned by the steams of various little ponds, which were then boiling naturally in the earth. Some of these ponds were as white as milk, some quite blue, and many others of different colors. I had taken some potatoes with me, and I put them into different ponds, and in a few minutes they were well boiled. I tasted some of them, but they were very sulfurous, and the silver shoe buckles, and all the other things of that metal we had among us, were, in a little time, turned as black as lead. Sometime in the year 1763 kind providence seemed to appear rather more favorable to me. One of my master's vessels, a Bermuda's sloop, about sixty tons, was commanded by one Captain Thomas Farmer, an Englishman, a very alert and active man, who gained my master a great deal of money by his good management in carrying passengers from one island to another but very often his sailors used to get drunk and run away from the vessel, which hindered him in his business very much. This man had taken a liking to me, and many different times begged of my master to let me go a trip with him as a sailor, but he would tell him he could not spare me, though the vessel sometimes could not go for want of hands, for sailors were generally very scarce in the island. However, at last, from necessity or force, my master was prevailed on, though very reluctantly, to let me go with this captain, but he gave great charge to him to take care that I did not run away, for if I did he would make him pay for me. This being the case, the captain had for some time a sharp eye upon me whenever the vessel anchored, and as soon as she returned I was sent for on shore again. Thus was I slaving as it were for life, sometimes at one thing and sometimes at another, so that the captain and I were nearly the most useful men in my master's employment. I also became so useful to the captain on shipboard, that many times, when he used to ask for me to go with him, though it should be but for twenty-four hours, to some of the islands near us, my master would answer he could not spare me, at which the captain would swear, and would not go the trip and tell my master I was better to him on board than any three white men he had, for they used to behave ill in many respects, particularly in getting drunk, and then they frequently got the boat stove, so as to hinder the vessel from coming back as soon as she might have done. This my master knew very well, and at last, by the captain's constant entreaties, after I had been several times with him, one day, to my great joy, my master told me the captain would not let him rest, and asked me whether I would go aboard as a sailor, or stay on shore and mine the stores, for he could not bear any longer to be plagued in this manner. I was very happy at this proposal, for I immediately thought I might in time stand some chance by being on board to get a little money, 
or possibly make my escape if I should be used ill, I also expected to get better food, and in greater abundance, for I had felt much hunger oftentimes, though my master treated his slaves, as I have observed, uncommonly well. I therefore, without hesitation, answered him, that I would go and be a sailor if he pleased. Accordingly I was ordered on board directly. Nevertheless, between the vessel and the shore, when she was in port, I had little or no rest, as my master always wished to have me along with him. Indeed he was a very pleasant gentleman, and but for my expectations on shipboard I should not have thought of leaving him. But the captain liked me also very much, and I was entirely his right hand man. I did all I could to deserve his favour, and in return I received better treatment from him than any other I believe ever met with in the West Indies in my situation. After I had been sailing for some time with this captain, at length I endeavoured to try my luck and commence merchant. I had but a very small capital to begin with, for one single half bit, which is equal to three pence in England, made up my whole stock. However I trusted to the Lord to be with me, and at one of our trips to St. Ustata, a Dutch island, I bought a glass tumbler with my half bit, and when I came to Montserrat I sold it for a bit, or sixpence. Luckily we made several successive trips to St. Ustata, which was a general mart for the West Indies, about twenty leagues from Montserrat, and in our next, finding my tumbler so profitable, with this one bit I bought two tumblers more, and when I came back I sold them for two bits, equal to a shilling sterling. When we went again I bought with these two bits four more of these glasses, which I sold for four bits on our return to Montserrat, and in our next voyage to St. Estatu I bought two glasses with one bit, and with the other three I bought a jug of Geneva, nearly about three pints in measure. When we came to Montserrat I sold the gin for eight bits, and the tumblers for two, so that my capital now amounted in all to a dollar, well husbanded and acquired in the space of a month or six weeks, when I blessed the Lord that I was so rich. As we sailed to different islands, I laid this money out in various things occasionally, and it used to turn out to very good account, especially when we went to Guadeloupe, Grenada, and the rest of the French islands. Thus was I going all about the islands upwards of four years, and ever trading as I went, during which I experienced many instances of ill usage, and have seen many injuries done to other Negroes in our dealings with Europeans, and, amidst our recreations, when we have been dancing and merry-making, they, without cause, have molested and insulted us. Indeed I was more than once obliged to look up to God on high as I had advised the poor fisherman some time before. And I had not been long trading for myself in the manner I have related above, when I experienced the like trial in company with him as follows. This man being used to the water, was upon an emergency put on board of us by his master to work as another hand, on a voyage to Santa Cruz, and at our sailing he had brought his little all for a venture, which consisted of six bits worth of limes and oranges in a bag, I had also my whole stock, which was about twelve bits worth of the same kind of goods, separate in two bags, for we had heard these fruits sold well in that island. When we came there, in some little convenient time he and I went ashore with our fruits to sell them, but we had scarcely landed when we were met by two white men, who presently took our three bags from us. We could not at first guess what they meant to do, and for some time we thought they were jesting with us, but they too soon let us know otherwise, for they took our ventures immediately to a house hard by, and adjoining the fort, while we followed all the way begging of them to give us our fruits, but in vain. They not only refused to return them, but swore at us, and threatened if we did not immediately depart they would flog us well. We told them these three bags were all we were worth in the world, and that we brought them with us to sell when we came from Montserrat, and showed them the vessel. But this was rather against us, as they now saw we were strangers as well as slaves. They still therefore swore, and desired us to be gone, and even took sticks to beat us, while we, seeing they meant what they said, went off in the greatest confusion and despair. Thus, 
in the very minute of gaining more by three times than I ever did by any venture in my life before, was I deprived of every farthing I was worth. An insupportable misfortune. But how to help ourselves we knew not. In our consternation we went to the commanding officer of the fort and told him how we had been served by some of his people, but we obtained not the least redress, he answered our complaints only by a volley of imprecations against us, and immediately took a horsewhip, in order to chastise us, so that we were obliged to turn out much faster than we came in. I now, in the agony of distress and indignation, wished that the ire of God in his forked lightning might transfix these cruel oppressors among the dead. Still however we persevered, went back again to the house, and begged and besought them again and again for our fruits, till at last some other people that were in the house asked if we would be contented if they kept one bag and gave us the other two. We, seeing no remedy whatever, consented to this, and they, observing one bag to have both kinds of fruit in it, which belonged to my companion, kept that, and the other two, which were mine, they gave us back. As soon as I got them, I ran as fast as I could, and got the first negro man I could to help me off. My companion, however, stayed a little longer to plead. He told them the bag they had was his, and likewise all that he was worth in the world, but this was of no avail, and he was obliged to return without it. The poor old man, wringing his hands, cried bitterly for his loss, and, indeed, he then did look up to God on high, which so moved me with pity for him, that I gave him nearly one third of my fruits. We then proceeded to the markets to sell them, and providence was more favorable to us than we could have expected, for we sold our fruits uncommonly well, I got for mine about thirty-seven bits. Such a surprising reverse of fortune in so short a space of time seemed like a dream to me, and proved no small encouragement for me to trust the Lord in any situation. My captain afterwards frequently used to take my part, and get me my right, when I have been plundered or used ill by these tender Christian depredators, among whom I have shuddered to observe the unceasing blasphemous execrations which are wantonly thrown out by persons of all ages and conditions, not only without occasion, but even as if they were indulgences and pleasure. At one of our trips to St. Kitts I had eleven bits of my own, and my friendly captain lent me five bits more, with which I bought a Bible. I was very glad to get this book, which I scarcely could meet with anywhere. I think there was none sold in Montserrat, and, much to my grief, from being forced out of the Etna in the manner I have related, my Bible, and the Guide to the Indians, the two books I loved above all others, were left behind. While I was in this place, St. Kitts, a very curious imposition on human nature took place colon a white man wanted to marry in the church a free black woman that had land and slaves in Montserrat, but the clergyman told him it was against the law of the place to marry a white and a black in the church. The man then asked to be married on the water, to which the parson consented, and the two lovers went in one boat, and the parson and clerk in another, and thus the ceremony was performed. After this the loving pair came on board our vessel, and my captain treated them extremely well, and brought them safe to Montserrat. The reader cannot but judge of the irksomeness of this situation to a mind like mine, in being daily exposed to new hardships and impositions, after having seen many better days, and having been as it were in a state of freedom and plenty, added to which, Every part of the world I had hitherto been in seemed to me a paradise in comparison of the West Indies. My mind was therefore hourly replete with inventions and thoughts of being freed, and, if possible, by honest and honourable means. For I always remembered the old adage, and I trust it has ever been my ruling principle, that honesty is the best policy, and likewise that other golden precept, to do unto all men as I would they should do unto me. However, as I was from early years a predestinarian, I thought whatever fate had determined must ever come to pass, and therefore, if ever it were my lot to be freed nothing could prevent me, although I should at present see no means or hope to obtain my freedom, on the other hand, if it were my fate not to be freed I never should be so, and all my endeavours for that purpose would be fruitless.
In the midst of these thoughts I therefore looked up with prayers anxiously to God for my liberty, and at the same time I used every honest means, and endeavoured all that was possible on my part to obtain it. In process of time I became master of a few pounds, and in a fair way of making more, which my friendly captain knew very well. This occasioned him sometimes to take liberties with me, but whenever he treated me waspishly I used plainly to tell him my mind, and that I would die before I would be imposed on as other negroes were, and that to me life had lost its relish when liberty was gone. This I said although I foresaw my then well-being or future helps of freedom humanly speaking, depended on this man. However, as he could not bear the thoughts of my not sailing with him, he always became mild on my threats. I therefore continued with him, and, from my great attention to his orders and his business, I gained him credit, and through his kindness to me I at last procured my liberty. While I thus went on, filled with the thoughts of freedom, and resisting oppression as well as I was able, my life hung daily in suspense, particularly in the surfs I have formerly mentioned, as I could not swim. These are extremely violent throughout the West Indies, and I was ever exposed to their howling rage and devouring fury in all the islands. I have seen them strike and toss a boat right up an end, and maim several on board. Once in the Grenada Islands, when I and about eight others were pulling a large boat with two puncheons of water in it, a surf struck us, and drove the boat and all in it about half a stone's throw, among some trees, and above the high water mark. We were obliged to get all the assistance we could from the nearest estate to mend the boat, and launch it into the water again. At Montserrat one night, in pressing hard to get off the shore on board, the punt was overset with us four times, the first time I was very near being drowned, however the jacket I had on kept me up above water a little space of time, while I called on a man near me who was a good swimmer, and told him I could not swim, he then made haste to me, and, just as I was sinking, he caught hold of me, and brought me to sounding, and then he went and brought the punt also. As soon as we had turned the water out of her, lest we should be used ill for being absent, we attempted again three times more, and as often the horrid surf served us as at first, but at last, the fifth time we attempted, we gained our point, at the imminent hazard of our lives. One day also, at Old Road in Montserrat, our captain, and three men besides myself, were going in a large canoe in quest of rum and sugar, when a single surf tossed the canoe an amazing distance from the water, and some of us even a stone's throw from each other, most of us were very much bruised, so that I and many more often said, and really thought, that there was not such another place under the heavens as this. I longed therefore much to leave it, and daily wished to see my master's promise performed of going to Philadelphia. While we lay in this place a very cruel thing happened on board of our sloop which filled me with horror, though I found afterwards such practices were frequent. There was a very clever and decent free young mulatto man who sailed a long time with us. He had a free woman for his wife, by whom he had a child, and she was then living on shore, and all very happy. Our captain and mate, and other people on board and several elsewhere, even the natives of Bermudas, all knew this young man from a child that he was always free, and no one had ever claimed him as their property, however, as might too often overcomes right in these parts, it happened that a Bermudas captain, whose vessel lay there for a few days in the road, came on board of us, and seeing the mulatto man, whose name was Joseph Clipson, he told him he was not free, and that he had orders from his master to bring him to Bermudas. The poor man could not believe the captain to be in earnest, but he was very soon undeceived, his men laying violent hands on him, and although he showed a certificate of his being born free in St. Kitts, and most people on board knew that he served his time to boat building, and always passed for a free man, yet he was taken forcibly out of our vessel. He then asked to be carried ashore before the secretary or magistrates, and these infernal invaders of human rights promised him he should. But, instead of that, they carried him on board of the other vessel, and the next day, without giving the poor man any hearing on shore, 
or suffering him even to see his wife or child, he was carried away, and probably doomed never more in this world to see them again. Nor was this the only instance of this kind of barbarity I was a witness to. I have since often seen in Jamaica and other islands free men, whom I have known in America, thus villainously trepanned and held in bondage. I have heard of two similar practices even in Philadelphia, and were it not for the benevolence of the Quakers in that city many of the sable race, who now breathe the air of liberty, would, I believe, be groaning indeed under some planter's chains. These things opened my mind to a new scene of horror to which I had been before a stranger. Hitherto I had thought only slavery dreadful, but the state of a free negro appeared to me now equally so at least, and in some respects even worse, for they live in constant alarm for their liberty, and even this is but nominal, for they are universally insulted and plundered without the possibility of redress for such is the equity of the West Indian laws, that no free negro's evidence will be admitted in their courts of justice. In this situation is it surprising that slaves, when mildly treated, should prefer even the misery of slavery to such a mockery of freedom. I was now completely disgusted with the West Indies, and thought I never should be entirely free until I had left them. With thoughts like these my anxious boding mind recall those pleasing scenes I left behind, scenes where fair liberty in bright array makes darkness bright, and e'en illumines day, where no complexion, wealth, or station, can protect the wretch who makes a slave of man. I determined to make every exertion to obtain my freedom, and to return to old England. For this purpose I thought a knowledge of navigation might be of use to me, for, though I did not intend to run away unless I should be ill-used, yet, in such a case, if I understood navigation, I might attempt my escape in our sloop, which was one of the swiftest sailing vessels in the West Indies, and I could be at no loss for hands to join me, and if I should make this attempt, I had intended to have gone for England, but this, as I said, was only to be in the event of my meeting with any ill usage. I therefore employed the mate of our vessel to teach me navigation, for which I agreed to give him twenty-four dollars, and actually paid him part of the money down, though when the captain, some time after, came to know that the mate was too such a sum for teaching me, he rebuked him, and said it was a shame for him to take any money from me. However, my progress in this useful art was much retarded by the constancy of our work. Had I wished to run away I did not want opportunities, which frequently presented themselves, and particularly at one time, soon after this. When we were at the island of Guadeloupe, there was a large fleet of merchantmen bound for old France, and, seamen then being very scarce, they gave from fifteen to twenty pounds a man for the run. Our mate, and all the white sailors, left our vessel on this account, and went on board of the French ships. They would have had me also to go with them, for they regarded me, and they swore to protect me, if I would go, and, as the fleet was to sail the next day, I really believe I could have got safe to Europe at that time. However, as my master was kind, I would not attempt to leave him, and, remembering the old maxim, that honesty is the best policy, I suffered them to go without me. Indeed my captain was much afraid of my leaving him and the vessel at that time, as I had so fair an opportunity, but, I thank God, this fidelity of mine turned out much to my advantage hereafter, when I did not in the least think of it, and made me so much in favor with the captain, that he used now and then to teach me some parts of navigation himself, but some of our passengers, and others, seeing this, found much fault with him for it, saying it was a very dangerous thing to let a negro know navigation, thus I was hindered again in my pursuits. About the latter end of the year 1764 my master bought a larger sloop, called the Providence, about seventy or eighty tons, of which my captain had the command. I went with him into this vessel, and we took a load of new slaves for Georgia and Charlestown. My master now left me entirely to the captain, though he still wished for me to be with him, but I, who always much wished to lose sight of the West Indies, was not a little rejoiced at the thoughts of seeing any other country.
therefore, relying on the goodness of my captain, I got ready all the little venture I could, and, when the vessel was ready, we sailed, to my great joy. When we got to our destined places, Georgia and Charlestown, I expected I should have an opportunity of selling my little property to advantage. But here, particularly in Charlestown, I met with buyers, white men, who imposed on me as in other places. Notwithstanding, I was resolved to have fortitude, thinking no lot or trial is too hard when kind heaven is the rewarder. We soon got loaded again, and returned to Montserrat, and there, amongst the rest of the islands, I sold my goods well, and in this manner I continued trading during the year 1764, meeting with various scenes of imposition, as usual. After this, my master fitted out his vessel for Philadelphia, in the year 1765, and during the time we were loading her, and getting ready for the voyage, I worked with redoubled alacrity, from the hope of getting money enough by these voyages to buy my freedom in time, if it should please God, and also to see the town of Philadelphia, which I had heard a great deal about for some years past. Besides which, I had always longed to prove my master's promise the first day I came to him. In the midst of these elevated ideas, and while I was about getting my little merchandise in readiness, one Sunday my master sent for me to his house. When I came there I found him and the captain together, and, on my going in, I was struck with astonishment at his telling me he heard that I meant to run away from him when I got to Philadelphia, and therefore, said he, I must sell you again, you cost me a great deal of money, no less than forty pounds sterling, and it will not do to lose so much. You are a valuable fellow, continued he, and I can get any day for you one hundred guineas, from many gentlemen in this island. And then he told me of Captain Duran's brother-in-law, a severe master, who ever wanted to buy me to make me his overseer. My captain also said he could get much more than a hundred guineas for me in Carolina. This I knew to be a fact, for the gentleman that wanted to buy me came off several times on board of us, and spoke to me to live with him, and said he would use me well. When I asked what work he would put me to he said, as I was a sailor, he would make me a captain of one of his rice vessels. But I refused, and fearing, at the same time, by a sudden turn I saw in the captain's temper, he might mean to sell me, I told the gentleman I would not live with him on any condition, and that I certainly would run away with his vessel, but he said he did not fear that, as he would catch me again, and then he told me how cruelly he would serve me if I should do so. My captain, however, gave him to understand that I knew something of navigation, so he thought better of it, and, to my great joy, he went away. I now told my master I did not say I would run away in Philadelphia, neither did I mean it, as he did not use me ill, nor yet the captain, for if they did I certainly would have made some attempts before now, but as I thought that if it were God's will I ever should be freed it would be so, and, on the contrary, if it was not his will it would not happen, so I hoped, if ever I were freed, whilst I was used well, it should be by honest means but, as I could not help myself, he must do as he pleased, I could only hope and trust to the God of heaven, and at that instant my mind was big with inventions and full of schemes to escape. I then appealed to the captain whether he ever saw any sign of my making the least attempt to run away, and asked him if I did not always come on board according to the time for which he gave me liberty, and, more particularly, when all our men left us at Guadeloupe and went on board of the French fleet, and advised me to go with them, whether I might not, and that he could not have got me again. To my no small surprise, and very great joy, the captain confirmed every syllable that I had said, and even more, for he said he had tried different times to see if I would make any attempt of this kind, both at St. Estate and in America, and he never found that I made the smallest, but, on the contrary, I always came on board according to his orders, and he did really believe, if I ever meant to run away, that, as I could never have had a better opportunity, I would have done it the night the mate and all the people left our vessel at Gordloop. The captain then informed my master, 
who had been thus imposed on by our mate, though I did not know who was my enemy. The reason the mate had for imposing this lie upon him, which was, because I had acquainted the captain of the provisions the mate had given away or taken out of the vessel. This speech of the captain was like life to the dead to me, and instantly my soul glorified God, and still more so on hearing my master immediately say that I was a sensible fellow, and he never did intend to use me as a common slave, and that but for the entreaties of the captain, and his character of me, he would not have let me go from the stores about as I had done, that also, in so doing, he thought by carrying one little thing or other to different places to sell I might make money. That he also intended to encourage me in this by crediting me with half a puncheon of rum and half a hogshead of sugar at a time, so that, from being careful, I might have money enough, in some time, to purchase my freedom, and, when that was the case, I might depend upon it he would let me have it for forty pounds sterling money, which was only the same price he gave for me. This sound gladdened my poor heart beyond measure, though indeed it was no more than the very idea I had formed in my mind of my master long before, and I immediately made him this reply, Sir, I always had that very thought of you, indeed I had, and that made me so diligent in serving you. He then gave me a large piece of silver coin, such as I never had seen or had before, and told me to get ready for the voyage, and he would credit me with a tears of sugar, and another of rum. He also said that he had two amiable sisters in Philadelphia, from whom I might get some necessary things. Upon this my noble captain desired me to go aboard, and, knowing the African metal, he charged me not to say anything of this matter to anybody, and he promised that the lying mate should not go with him any more. This was a change indeed, in the same hour to feel the most exquisite pain, and in the turn of a moment the fullest joy. It caused in me such sensations as I was only able to express in my looks, my heart was so overpowered with gratitude that I could have kissed both of their feet. When I left the room I immediately went, or rather flew, to the vessel, which being loaded, my master, as good as his word, trusted me with a tears of rum, and another of sugar, when we sailed, and arrived safe at the elegant town of Philadelphia. I soon sold my goods here pretty well, and in this charming place I found everything plentiful and cheap. While I was in this place a very extraordinary occurrence befell me. I had been told one evening of a wise woman, a Mrs. Davis, who revealed secrets, foretold events, and see. I put little faith in this story at first, as I could not conceive that any mortal could foresee the future disposals of providence, nor did I believe in any other revelation than that of the holy scriptures. However, I was greatly astonished at seeing this woman in a dream that night, though a person I never before beheld in my life. This made such an impression on me, that I could not get the idea the next day out of my mind, and I then became as anxious to see her as I was before and different. Accordingly in the evening, after we left off working, I inquired where she lived, and being directed to her, to my inexpressible surprise, beheld the very woman in the very same dress she appeared to me to wear in the vision. She immediately told me I had dreamed of her the preceding night related to me many things that had happened with a correctness that astonished me, and finally told me I should not be long a slave. This was the more agreeable news, as I believed it the more readily from her having so faithfully related the past incidents of my life. She said I should be twice in very great danger of my life within eighteen months, which, if I escaped, I should afterwards go on well, so, giving me her blessing, we parted. After staying here some time till our vessel was loaded, and I had bought in my little traffic, we sailed from this agreeable spot for Montserrat, once more to encounter the raging surfs. We arrived safe at Montserrat, where we discharged our cargo, and soon after that we took slaves on board for St. Tata, and from thence to Georgia. I had always exerted myself and did double work in order to make our voyages as short as possible, and from thus overworking myself while we were at Georgia I caught a fever and ague. I was very ill for eleven days and near dying. Eternity was now exceedingly impressed on my mind, and I feared very much that awful event. 
I prayed the Lord therefore to spare me, and I made a promise in my mind to God, that I would be good if ever I should recover. At length, from having an eminent doctor to attend me, I was restored again to health, and soon after we got the vessel loaded, and set off for Montserrat. During the passage, as I was perfectly restored, and had much business of the vessel to mind, all my endeavours to keep up my integrity, and perform my promise to God, began to fail, and, in spite of all I could do, as we drew nearer and nearer to the islands, my resolutions more and more declined, as if the very air of that country or climate seemed fatal to piety. When we were safe arrived at Montserrat, and I had got ashore, I forgot my former resolutions. Alas! How prone is the heart to leave that God it wishes to love! And how strongly do the things of this world strike the senses and captivate the soul! Exclamation mark After our vessel was discharged, we soon got her ready, and took in, as usual, some of the poor oppressed natives of Africa, and other Negroes. We then set off again for Georgia and Charlestown. We arrived at Georgia, and, having landed part of our cargo, proceeded to Charlestown with the remainder. While we were there I saw the town illuminated, the guns were fired, and bonfires and other demonstrations of joy shown, on account of the repeal of the Stamp Act. Here I disposed of some goods on my own account, the white men buying them with smooth promises and fair words, giving me however but very indifferent payment. There was one gentleman particularly who bought a puncheon of rum of me, which gave me a great deal of trouble, and, although I used the interest of my friendly captain, I could not obtain anything for it, for, being an agro man, I could not oblige him to pay me. This vexed me much, not knowing how to act, and I lost some time in seeking after this Christian, and though, when the Sabbath came, which the Negroes usually make their holiday, I was much inclined to go to public worship, I was obliged to hire some black men to help to pull a boat across the water to God in quest of this gentleman. When I found him, after much entreaty, both from myself and my worthy captain, he at last paid me in dollars, some of them, however, were copper, and of consequence of no value, but he took advantage of my being an agro man, and obliged me to put up with those or none, although I objected to them. Immediately after, as I was trying to pass them in the market, amongst other white men, I was abused for offering to pass bad coin, and, though I showed them the man I got them from, I was within one minute of being tied up and flogged without either judge or jury. However, by the help of a good pair of heels, I ran off, and so escaped the bastinados I should have received. I got on board as fast as I could, but still continued in fear of them until we sailed which I thanked God we did not long after, and I have never been amongst them since. We soon came to Georgia, where we were to complete our lading, and here worse fate than ever attended me, for one Sunday night, as I was with some negroes in their master's yard in the town of Savannah, it happened that their master, one Dr. Perkins, who was a very severe and cruel man, came in drunk and, not liking to see any strange negroes in his yard, he and a ruffian of a white man he had in his service beset me in an instant, and both of them struck me with the first weapons they could get hold of. I cried out as long as I could for help and mercy, but, though I gave a good account of myself, and he knew my captain, who lodged hard by him, it was to no purpose. They beat and mangled me in a shameful manner, leaving me near dead, I lost so much blood from the wounds I received, that I lay quite motionless, and was so benumbed that I could not feel anything for many hours. Early in the morning they took me away to the jail. As I did not return to the ship all night, my captain, not knowing where I was, and being uneasy that I did not then make my appearance, he made inquiry after me, and, having found where I was, immediately came to me. As soon as the good man saw me so cut and mangled, he could not forbear weeping, he soon got me out of jail to his lodgings, and immediately sent for the best doctors in the place, who at first declared it as their opinion that I could not recover. My captain on this went to all the lawyers in the town for their advice, but they told him they could do nothing for me as I was a negro. 
He then went to Dr. Perkins, the hero who had vanquished me, and menaced him, swearing he would be revenged of him, and challenged him to fight. But cowardice is ever the companion of cruelty, and the doctor refused. However, by the skillfulness of one Dr. Brady of that place, I began at last to amend, but, although I was so sore and bad with the wounds I had all over me that I could not rest in any posture, yet I was in more pain on account of the captain's uneasiness about me than I otherwise should have been. The worthy man nursed and watched me all the hours of the night, and I was, through his attention and that of the doctor, able to get out of bed in about sixteen or eighteen days. All this time I was very much wanted on board, as I used frequently to go up and down the river for rafts, and other parts of our cargo, and stow them when the mate was sick or absent. In about four weeks I was able to go on duty, and in a fortnight after, having got in all our lading, our vessel set sail for Montserrat, and in less than three weeks we arrived there safe towards the end of the year. This ended my adventures in 1764 for I did not leave Montserrat again till the beginning of the following year.